Hi, I'm Ted Bible, pastor at St. Mark's Methodist Church, and thank you for joining me today as we continue our, our walk with Jesus as we go through the Gospel of Mark. But before we begin uh, today's sermon, I'd like to invite you to share any prayer concerns, joys or, con joys or concerns that you would like for us to be in prayer with you over. Uh, all you need to do is email that request to limastmarks at gmail.com, limastmarks at gmail.com, and we would be happy to be in prayer for you. Additionally, if you don't have a church family, we would like to invite you to come and be our guest some Sunday morning. Uh, we meet for worship services here at the church at, uh, at 1015 in the morning, and we are located at 1110 North Metcalf Street on the north end of Lima. Well, last week I provided you with a brief introduction to the author of the Gospel of John, a man named John Mark that we are introduced to in chapter 13, or that we at least learn about him in chapter 13 when he went on uh, a missionary journey with the Apostle Paul on Paul's first missionary journey. That journey did not turn out well for Mark. Without being given any uh, specific details, we know that Mark left his cousin Barnabas and Paul mid-journey, which created some bad feelings uh, with Paul. In fact, Paul later refused to take Mark with him on another missionary trip because he felt that, that Mark had deserted them, which caused a split then between Barnabas, who is again Mark's cousin, and Paul. This resulted then in Paul taking Silas on a missionary trip and Barnabas then going on his own missionary trip and taking Mark with him. Now, whatever the reason, whatever the mistake or the failure that took place that caused Mark to desert Paul and Barnabas on that first trip, whatever that was, it was not the end of the road for Mark. He later redeemed himself with Paul. In fact, he was forgiven by Paul, and Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, that Mark has been of great assistance to him in his ministry. So where did Mark get his information, uh, the information that was required for him to write this gospel account uh, that we know as the gospel of Mark? Well, in Acts chapter 12, we learn about or read about the apostle Peter, who was miraculously released from prison by an angel of God. Now, Peter went to the home of Mary, Mary, who was the mother of, you got it, John Mark. Now, scholars believe that Mark's writing is based on the first-hand knowledge and the experiences that Peter shared with him, which enabled him then to write this very first gospel account. Well, today we, uh, we pick up the story. Uh, again, we're in Mark chapter 1. We pick up at verse 14, and I'll be reading... Uh, verses 14 and 15, to be, get things started off. And it reads that after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. He said, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, I'm not going to speak about, uh, at least not now, about the events surrounding uh, John being put into prison because Mark's going to address that in some specific detail. Excuse me, Mark's going to address that in some specific detail in chapter 6. But upon John's imprisonment, Jesus goes to the region of Galilee to begin his ministry. Now, Galilee was a large populated area north of Judea and Jerusalem where Jews and Gentiles lived together, although they lived in distinct and separate cities. Galilee was not a small region. According to the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, Galilee was an area of about 60 miles by 30 miles and contained over 200 villages, and it had a population of over, about, over 3 million people. So what is the good news which Jesus came to deliver? Most people would have thought that it had to do with a, with a political kingdom that would replace the oppressive occupation of the, of the Romans. But that was not the case. The good news that Jesus came proclaiming was the good news of peace, of truth, and of salvation. Peace was the restoration of the people's relationship with God. The truth that, G that Jesus proclaimed was that God and his word are always reliable. And the salvation 
which represents the liberty from sin and, and, and freedom to live as sons and daughters of God. Jesus said the time has come. Now, there are two ancient Greek words that can be used to translate time. One is chronos, which means chronological time, such as 1045 a.m., for example. The other word is kairos, which means a decisive moment, a time for action. And Jesus uses that second word, kairos, when he said the time has come. He wanted people to know that the long-awaited Messiah was making himself known to the people and that now was the time. Now was the time to take action. Now was the time for them to encounter the kingdom of God. In announcing the good news, Jesus made two demands. He told the people to repent and he told them to believe. Now, repentance requires a life change. It requires a change of mind and a change in behavior. These changes will cause us to now realize that sin is wrong, that sin needs to be avoided, and that sin has consequences. Now, contrary to the expectations of most people of the day, Jesus brought a kingdom of love, not a kingdom of domination. He brought a kingdom of grace, not a kingdom built upon the law. He brought a kingdom of humility and not pride and a kingdom that was not just for the Jews, but it was a kingdom available to everyone. And it was also a kingdom that had to be received voluntarily by the people. It would not be a kingdom forced upon people, not then and certainly not now. When Jesus told the people to believe the good news, he wanted people to know what it was like to live in the kingdom. The kingdom Jesus preached about required them to trust God, taking him at his word and living in relationship with him and living in dependence upon him. Now, the rest of chapter one, and in fact, the entire book of Mark, will stress the work of Jesus and his miracles. But with this opening statement, Mark reminds us that the focus of Jesus' ministry was preaching the gospel, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus was a preacher who did miracles. He was not a miracle worker who also preached. Reading on then, verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. For they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. This was not the first time that Jesus had met this group of men. You can read more about that prior meeting in the Gospel of John and in chapters 1 through 4. But notice that these guys were just common men. They had no theological credentials, and they had no status in the world, and likely they had no status in their own community. Jesus met them where they were. They were working. They were fishermen. Jesus chose these men to be his disciples, not for who they were, but for what Jesus could do through them. Now, as skilled fishermen, however, these men did have qualities that would serve them well as Jesus' disciples and later as his apostles. These men were courageous. They knew how to work together. They had patience. They had energy. They had stamina. They had faith and they had tenacity. Professional, professional fishermen were not quitters. With the invitation to come follow me and I will make you fishers of men, Jesus states clearly what Christianity is all about. It is about following Jesus. At its root, Christianity is not about theological systems or rules. It's first and foremost about following Jesus, which leads to obedience to his teachings. 
When Jesus said that he would make them fishers of men, he is suggesting that this would be a gradual process. It's going to take some time. It's not just going to happen overnight. And Jesus called them to do what he is doing. Jesus was the greatest fisherman of men and women ever. But he wanted others to join in the work that he was doing. And it started with these four, then it expanded to 12, then it expanded from there to 72, and then thousands and thousands upon thousands throughout the centuries, leading up to the day where he is still calling us to go fishing as well. Reading on then, verse 21. They went to, to uh, Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and he began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as teachers of the law. Typically, the Jewish synagogue had no set teachers. Instead, they had the custom of inviting learned guests to come and to read scripture during the day. This custom gave Jesus the opportunity to preach, and we are told that those present were astonished at his teaching. They had never heard anyone teach quite like this before because he taught as one who had authority. Now, the scribes of Jesus' day rarely taught boldly. They would often simply disquote a variety of rabbis and their interpretation and their opinion of the scriptures. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus taught with authority because he had authority. He brought a divine message that was from God. He wasn't quoting from man, but rather he was speaking for God. Reading on, verses 23 through 28. Just then a man in, in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be, be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority, and he even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. A man with an unclean spirit or an evil spirit means that he is demon-possessed. Why he was demon-possessed, how long he had been in this situation, and even how long he had been attending the synagogue, these things we do not know. What we do know is that the evil spirit knew Jesus, the Holy One of God. He had no control over Jesus and no ability to resist Jesus. Jesus told the evil spirit to be quiet and to leave the man, and it had to comply with his order. This was the first of four exorcisms that Mark includes in his, in his, uh, in his gospel writing. And as, I would and as would obviously be the case, the people were indeed amazed. They were amazed at his teaching. They were amazed at his authority, and they were amazed in the fact that evil spirits obeyed his commands. This was exciting. And what the people heard and what the people witnessed was worth sharing with others. And in fact, the word spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. Once again, as mentioned earlier, to 200 villages, and over three million people. Reading on then from verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Church was over. In other words, the time in the synagogue was over, and Peter took Jesus home with him. Now, how often do you take Jesus home with you after church? I mean, does he continue to reside in your heart and in your mind and in your soul? 
Do you take him home with you so that he can be with you throughout the week as you face the challenges, the opportunities, as you face the doctor's visits, as you face having difficult conversations with family, friends, classmates, co-workers, and friends? You can't leave Jesus at church and say, see you next week, and expect life and its opportunities and challenges to be any different. You need to take Jesus home with you, just as Peter did. Now, it doesn't appear in our reading that Jesus was aware of Peter's mother-in-law's illness before he arrived at his home. But they, whoever they were, told Jesus of her fever, and he found her lying in bed, and he touched her. And the fever left her. This was the first of Jesus' miracles of healing that we find recorded in the Gospel of Mark. And notice that she was healed immediately. She was healed in full. She didn't linger around the house as if she was still, you know, struggling from the fever. She was healed and she served them immediately. Notice again, too, that the healing occurred without a word being spoken by Jesus, but rather it happened when he touched her. And then concluding our, 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 our readings for today, verse 32, that evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. It had been a long, busy day for Jesus, but his day wasn't over. His work wasn't over. Pay close attention to the description Mark provides us with what is happening here. In verse 33, it tells us that the whole town gathered at Peter's home. Now, scholars estimate that that would have been approximately 3,000 people, which included those who were sick and those who were disabled and those who were demon-possessed. Jesus ministered throughout the night to the whole town, to everyone who gathered at the door. Jesus had already had a long day, and now he was putting the needs of others ahead of his own as he ministered individually to each and every one of them. Now, there's lots I could say in regards to takeaways from the message for today, but I want to leave you with this one takeaway. Although Jesus came to destroy Satan's power, as was the case with the exorcism of the evil spirit from the man in the synagogue, and he came also to heal the sick, as he did with with Peter's mother-in-law, and the disabled, which we will read about in the upcoming chapters of the Gospel of Mark. This, though, was not his primary purpose. Jesus performed miracles because he had a heart for hurting people, And he did it to get the people's attention. Jesus came proclaiming the good news that he has come to break the power and control that sin has over people. He came to show them a new way, to introduce them to a new way of life that will be free of the consequences of sin, the sin that burdens them down and that makes the journey of life heavy and at times even overwhelming. Jesus brings us peace, which begins with the establishment of a relationship with the Prince of Peace, who is Jesus Christ. Now, the Jews long for freedom from Roman oppression. What are you longing to be free from? What is holding you captive? What is making your life miserable? What is overwhelming you with sadness and with grief? And with despair. What is it? Well, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the cure. Jesus is your Savior. There's a poem that I think uh, puts this in a pretty good perspective. So as I share this with you, I just wish to invite you to, to visualize what's taking place here. The film is titled Footsteps in the Sand. One night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with my Lord. 
Across the dark sky flash scenes from my life. For each scene, I notice two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I look back at the footsteps in the sand. I notice that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and the saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me. So I asked the Lord about it. I said, Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. But I noticed that at the, during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. Why, when I needed you the most, would you leave me? And then he whispered to me, My precious child, the times when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. As we go forward from here on our various journeys of life, and as we read through the Gospel of Mark, this important truth will be repeated to us over and over and over again. Our greatest comfort and our greatest hope for today and for the future rest in Jesus Christ and rest in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus came into the world to live among us, to die for us and to overcome death through his resurrection in order to free people from the burdens of their sins from their burdens of oppression, from the challenges and burdens of persecution and weariness. This, my friends, is the good news message of Jesus. This, my friends, is the good news of Jesus, our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the glorious good news of Jesus and that in him we have forgiveness of sins. Thank you that Jesus is the, only one, is the Holy One of God, who came in the likeness of human flesh so that he could live a life of purity and truth and offer that perfect life as the one and only acceptable offering for the sin of the world. Thank you that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and that his work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead has won victory over sin, over Satan, over death, and over hell. Thank you that Jesus is the power of God and the wisdom of God for all who believe in him. And thank you that there is nothing in heaven or earth that is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In his name we pray today. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me uh, today. And next week, we're going to, uh, to conclude uh, the readings of, from chapter one of the Gospel of Mark and invite you to, to come back and, and, and be with us. Uh, likewise, I, I do want to thank you for your prayer support of our ministries here at the church and for your financial support. And if you would like to bless us with a gift, you may do so by mailing it to St. Mark's Methodist Church, 1110 North Metcalf Street, Lima, Ohio, 458. Zero one. And until next time, uh, just remember the good news message of Jesus Christ. He came to save you. He loves you. He died for you. Go in peace.